um, steps. But uh, where we are now, we're actually on the Tell, right? So oh. levels of uh, cities have been built here at Dan. And after this, we will go and visit a gate that is 4,000 years old, wow. mm -hmm. standing in its entirety, and the oldest arch gate in the world, wow. which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. Kind of exciting. And would have been standing here at the time of Abraham. Mm -hmm. wow. So. Um, I'll go and look at that after, but this is the Israelite period that we're talking about. And uh, if we would take, take that path behind you, uh, that would take us back to the Israelite gate, which we'll go and visit afterwards as well, uh, which is exciting because there they found a gate with a judge's seat actually within the gates of the city. If anyone has ever, ever been found. But of course, so one of the things that Dan was, or this area was famous for, you remember that after the... This, um, time that Solomon builds the temple and after the reign of King Solomon there is a split in the kingdom mm -hmm. and we have Jeroboam ruling the northern ten tribes and Rehoboam ruling uh, Judah and Benjamin and of course uh, the thing that if you what you need to be doing is going to the temple to offer your uh, sacrifices and your offerings to God but of course if it meant that you travel from the northern tribes over to Jerusalem and of course, you always have to say up to Jerusalem, even though you think you're going you know, in that direction. We always say up to Jerusalem. Um, the thing was that uh, the revenue was going to the area of the temple in Jerusalem and to Rehoboam. And of course, Jeroboam decides he's going to put a stop to that. Uh, he wants to keep the revenue in his part of the, uh, if his ten tribes. And so what he does is he builds an alternative place, or two places, for the children of Israel to go and worship. So that was terrible to do something like that. You can imagine. It's going back to the days of Sinai because what he does is he makes a platform and puts a golden calf at the very northern end of his kingdom, which is up here at Dan, and he puts a golden calf at the very southern end of his kingdom, which is Bethel. Or Bethel, I don't know how you like to pronounce it. In Hebrew, Bethel. Remember, Beth is house. El God. So imagine Bethel with a golden calf. So, I mean, Bethel is right on the doorsteps of Jerusalem. That's how important it was for him to try and prevent them from going to Jerusalem. And so, um, what you've got in all archaeologists' dreams would be to find this place of pagan worship, you know, to prove that it really was true, etc. And sure enough, in the digging, they found it. Wow. So that's what you're looking at right in wow. front of you. This was the high place of wow. Dan. Wow. And uh, where they put the metal construction, that actually would have been the altar. Right? So what you fill that in is with stone, with its horns on the corners. Mm -hmm. And you can see steps going up. And the sacrificing of the uh, animals took place on the top of that altar. On top of that, you would put the... Uh, fire and, and so on and then you would put the animal and you would give it as a burnt offering on that altar and he copies the altar in Jerusalem from the time of Solomon so now you've got an exact size of what the altar looked like outside the temple of Solomon's temple so this picture is in stone of course not in metal but the foundations are there and then where we're going to be sitting up on the top of those steps on top of those steps, instead of us, would be the golden <coughs> calf. All right, because you're sacrificing <coughs> to the golden calf and not to God. And so that's what's happening over here. Um, so it's pretty amazing that they found it. Great excitement, as you can imagine. Uh, just to give you an idea, the native trees of Israel <coughs> used to be the oaks. We talked about it and to plant an oak tree today takes so many you know, hundreds of years to grow so that's why we plant <coughs> just about everything but oak but there is an ancient oak mm. you can see it's well looked after um, one of the few that hasn't been burnt down unfortunately some hikers do the reserve they used to smoke mm. now it's forbidden to smoke i still see them doing it occasionally and being careless have destroyed the ancient oaks that were left mm. in this nature How reserve. old is that one? So that's out? several hundred years old. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it mm -hmm. gives you an idea of what used to be in this country mm -hmm. before the Turks did the damage of uh, cutting them down. When we get to the uh, Israelite gate, you'll see a couple of oaks there. 
and they look as though they're part of the gate today because you know we can't ever cut a tree down mm -hmm. in this country even if you have uh, trees in your if you have a piece of land that you're building your house and there's a tree there that you might not fancy mm -hmm. even if you're allergic to that particular tree you can't imagine the permissions you have to get in order to remove it mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. they do not give it Usually it's better for you to move house <laughs> with your allergy than to try and get permission to get you not cut down trees in this country. It's forbidden. Um, so, uh, anyway, there's the old elephant we put on the top. Uh, one of the other great finds that was found here in uh, Dan, it, about 20 years ago when they were doing excavations, uh, we had a problem, or pe we didn't have a problem, people had a problem about David because. Uh, you know, the Jewish people, we love David, obviously it's, uh, David is uh, the person that makes Jerusalem his capital, he writes the Psalms, um, he unites the kingdom, you know, makes it this one big kingdom, I mean, David, uh, he might have had a few flaws in his character as far as women or a little bit of blood on his hands, but the major passion of David was for the Lord, he loved the Lord, and so I mean, we adore David in this country, of course, um, but one of the issues was that in all the surrounding writings, we have about all the other kings that are mentioned in the Bible. No mention of David. David is so wonderful, then why isn't a neighboring country writing about David? This was always an issue. And they wrote about Ahab, that has his prowess as a charioteer. They wrote about the other kings of Judah, Hezekiah, and so on. No, David. How can no one write about David in the neighboring countries? You know, and so people started to get skeptical. Anyway, people, that, you know, there's a, they're always looking for something. How come, you know, that the mm -hmm. Bible is whatever? So if they don't, they find one, they start the other. Um, and so there was this question mark over David. And whilst uh, they were excavating over here, they found a stone uh, that was written to the house of David. Mm -hmm. So let's stop the moment about David. Huh. find something else to murmur about but anyway we have it so um we have long enough in the israel museum you can go over to the room that has a sort of period of history you can go see the house of david and, and see all the things in the <coughs> of judah and scribe seals and everything it's really cool we yeah, have it all there uh, so anyway we're going to go and sit under the uh, on the steps in the sun it's nice and sunny and we're going to teach and then afterwards we'll go up on the top so don't go down go back up and I'll point out what you're looking at into Lebanon and so on. How, how, what it is. there was other groups and so they're not that burdensome to carry so just in case we needed them that's why I had to bring them. Um, today you're going to hear from me in two different places uh, here and then also at Caesarea Philippi and you kind of consider these um, challenges I guess you would say you know when we were on the Beatitudes last night we talked a little bit about the difference between <coughs> condemnation and conviction and um, because we will not be glorified until we see him face to face and although we've been justified by the work of what Jesus has done on the cross we now live in that in-between place of what's called sanctification and as we're being sanctified daily, we need the Holy Spirit to point out the things that, as Paul wrote in Hebrews, that those things that so easily entangle us and cause us to slip and to fall. And as he points those things out in our lives, <coughs> that's usually what the phrase conviction 
is. And it's that sort of prodding of areas that are not pleasing to God, that we've made compromises. And so uh, as we sit at this place, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I don't feel like I've been given the gift of discernment, although I, I think it's growing in me a little bit. But this is sort of a weird place. All of you are like sitting where there once was a calf that took the place of God. And, um, and then we have an altar behind me. And you know, the, the issue for Israel was that of forgetting and then following after other gods. And the Lord would have no part of that. And so I, I'm going to read a psalm to you, and then I want to talk a little bit about what idolatry, because that's where you're sitting, looks like today. And then allow the Holy Spirit to maybe poke us in some areas, convict us, in order for us to continue this process of being sanctified, with the end result being that we're better prepared for that next chapter in our life, for whatever God is calling us to do. Hopefully you'll hear from both Chuck and I that that's sort of the continual theme uh, that sort of uh, is the substructure to this tour. That you didn't come on your own, you were invited, and that the Lord has a word for you. So, with that, Psalm 115, the futility of idols and the trustworthiness of God. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy and because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. The idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. <laughs> They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O oh, house of Aaron, Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord nor any who go down into silence. But we, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, the futility of idols. Some might argue, well, a golden calf uh, you know, uh, I can ask the Holy Spirit to kind of probe my life, but I don't have a golden calf. I haven't erected 
uh, a statue or anything such as that to bow down to worship. But you have to understand the definition of idolatry. That it's not just a statue. But idolatry is man's convenience. It's man's <coughs> religion. It's anything that takes the place of God. For those up here, for Jeroboam, there was, it, was too, it was politically incorrect and financially unstable to have the faithful make their way to a pilgrimage three times a year up to Jerusalem to worship. And so, let's change the rules. Let's just worship God here in this place. Man's rules. More convenient will unify the northern tribes. And make no mistake, as you read through the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, page after page after page, warns the people. And he says, when you come into the land, the land that God has given to you, when you come into the land and you have vineyards and you have fields and you've built your houses, beware lest you forget the Lord your God. And so along with idolatry, and this was the curse of the north, along with idolatry came arrogance. That somehow in the midst of all these blessings, it's not just what the Lord has done for us, what we've done. It's our mighty armies. And all of a sudden, the Lord gets pushed further and further back in our lives. And so then we replace those things. It's through our arrogance and our pride. And it's within our culture. Our culture that raises children even in Christian homes, we adopt the culture of this world. And we want our kids to be powerful, to be prosperous, to be well-educated. What's wrong with those things, Dan? We want all those things. But we've inserted ourselves into a culture that literally is upside down in terms of what the teachings of Yeshua were all about. And we wonder why our lives sometimes feel empty and we lose our sunglasses <laughs> and different things such as that. Could it be it's because we've put ourselves in an area and we've assimilated ourselves into a culture that's dramatically opposite of what the Word of God teaches. The greatness comes to who? Fulfillment, where do you find it? Our world talks about greatness as being status. You climb that ladder. It's defined in how many people are under you. It's going to be defined by your possessions. You'll find fulfillment when your barns are full. Oh, really? You know, it was Rockefeller at the time that was the richest man in the world, and he was asked, how much does it take to truly be satisfied? And his answer, just a little bit more. You'll never find fulfillment in those areas. But what does Yeshua teach? He teaches that if you lose your life for his sake, guess what? You'll find it. What does Yeshua teach about servanthood? That the greatest in the kingdom are those who what? Serve. And you'll find life not in possessions, but in your walking with him. Wow, what a difference. And so when Billy Graham was asked the question, what's the chief sin in 